The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. I invite you to turn with me to Exodus, to the second book of the Bible, and to chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35, and we're going to read from verse 4. Uh, through to the seventh verse of chapter 36. And here instructions are being given for uh, another time, a second time, concerning the materials uh, for the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God, and for how they're going to be uh, uh, provided for. Moses said to the whole Israelite community, This is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and hides of sea cows, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. All who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle with its tent and its covering, clasps, frames, crossbars, posts, and bases. The ark with its poles and the atonement cover and the curtain that shields it the table with its poles and all its articles and the bread of the presence, the lampstand that is for light with its accessories, lamps, and oil for the light, the altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, the curtain for the doorway at the entrance to the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils, the bronze basin with its stand, the curtains of the courtyard with its posts and bases, and the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard, the tent pegs for the tabernacle and for the courtyard and their ropes, the woven garments worn for ministering in the sanctuary, both the sacred garments for Aaron and the priest, Aaron the priest, and the garments for his sons when they serve as priests. Then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence, and every one who was willing and whose heart moved him, came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting, for all its service, and for the sacred garments. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Everyone who had blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen, or goat hair, ram skins dyed red, or hides of sea cows brought them. Those presenting an offering of silver or bronze brought it as an offering to the Lord, and everyone who had acacia wood for any part of the work brought it. Every skilled woman spun with her hands and brought what she had spun—blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen, and all the women who were willing and had the skill spun the goat hair. The leaders brought onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. They also brought spices and olive oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord freewill offerings for all the work of the Lord through Moses that he had commanded them to do. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, one of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of artistic craftsmanship. And he has given both him and Oholiab, son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as craftsmen, designers, embroiderers in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, and weavers, all of them master craftsmen and designers. So Bezalel 
Aholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Aholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring freewill offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left their work and said to Moses, The people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more, because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. Amen. Father, as we turn now to the Bible, we pray that we might hear from your voice. We marvel at this great peculiar experience whereby the voice of a mere man becomes to us as we listen in faith and in obedience, the very voice of God to us. So we wait expectantly and humbly that we might hear from you and no one else, and that we might respond solely to the prompting and work of God the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Those who were present last Sunday will perhaps remember that we gathered our thoughts around one phrase that is found at the end of the seventh verse of Colossians chapter 2, and that phrase is overflowing with thankfulness. Overflowing with thankfulness. Throughout the days of the week that has passed, I have found myself returning to that phrase again and again, and I have a feeling that others along with me might have done the same. Not always to great encouragement, but sometimes to great challenge, monitoring my response to things or my attitude to things in light of the challenge of the phrase is the way in which I have just responded or I'm about to respond an expression of overflowing thankfulness. And it has served as something of a chart and compass to me, and I don't sense that it's going away anytime soon. We reminded ourselves that the foundation of this overflowing gratitude uh, lay in the grace of God as our Creator and Redeemer and the sustainer of our lives. We paid attention to the important distinction between the kind of natural gratitude which says thanks when everything is going well, but fails to find any reason for thankfulness when the circumstances of life overtake us, and gracious gratitude, which triumphs and glorifies God even when things are not the way we would desire them to be. We ended our time by thinking about expressions of this same thankfulness, and we focused primarily on the notion of this thankfulness being expressed in the lives of those who would have reason to doubt, perhaps, uh, whether what had happened to them was something that they ought to rejoice in and be grateful for. And we ended with the illustration of two women. You will perhaps recall uh, Sarah Edwards, the wife of Jonathan Edwards, and the lady with the long uh, Swedish name who lost her father on a sailing trip to Gothenburg. But I want to come back to this notion of expressing gratitude and the expressions of overflowing thankfulness, and I want, as you would have already deduced from our Scripture reading, to think of an expression of thankfulness in terms of generous giving to the work of the Lord generous giving to the work of the Lord. And I have read purposefully from Exodus 35, because it gives us one of the wonderful illustrations from the Old Testament of God's people overflowing generously in response to God's grace. Let's just highlight it by looking at verse 20 and 21 of Exodus 35 as we begin. Then the whole Israelite community 
withdrew from Moses' presence, and everyone who was willing and whose heart moved him came and brought an offering to the Lord. Now, we need to say something uh, concerning the context of this, uh, lest we uh, fiddle with the Bible. And the context is the whole Bible and is is certainly the book of Exodus, but we can't start at the very beginning. So let me encourage you, if you want, just to follow a couple of references with me uh, to begin by looking at Exodus chapter 25 and verse 1, where we have the first indication of the Lord giving instruction for the construction of the tabernacle. And it is there, as you will see, if you're using an NIV, in fact, they give that the heading, Offerings for the Tabernacle. And what God is doing there is he's uh, giving to his servant Moses the directives, which are to be passed on to the people, concerning uh, the place of meeting. In other words, the Ark of the Covenant set within the framework of the tabernacle was to be the place where the people of God symbolically met with God that this was uh, emblematic of his dwelling among them, God's people in God's place under God's direction. And it was in this tabernacle that they were to be reminded of three things. One, of God's awesome holiness, that he was distinctly unlike his creation, in that they were sinful and he was without sin. Secondly, of the people's need of cleansing, which becomes apparent when we are confronted by unfettered holiness. And thirdly, the provision of atonement for sin in the sacrificial system that was in place, always pointing forward to that final sacrifice in Christ himself. Well, this was all very well, and it was a good start there in Exodus chapter 25. But before ever things uh, got to where they needed to be, uh, there was a dreadful delay that, be- that kicked in. And that delay is described for us, sadly, in chapter 32. And here, if you know anything of Exodus or know anything of the Old Testament, you may know something of the fact that the people of God made a golden calf and they bowed down to it. Well, it's here in Exodus 32 that we discover the event uh, for ourselves. God had provided for his people in the exodus from Egypt. Uh, You may remember that when he told the people to get ready and to make the provisions for the Passover, that when they were then redeemed from the bondage of Egypt, one of the things they should do was to plunder the Egyptians. It may sound rather strange, uh, he, he said that they should actually ask their Egyptian uh, landlords and owners for their gold and their silver and their clothes so that they might take those provisions with them uh, when they uh, cross over into the promised land. And when you read that in its bold simplicity or bald simplicity, uh, you, you may say, well, why, why was God doing that? Just as a further punishment to the Egyptians? I don't think so. Just to line the, the, the pockets of his people? No, I don't think so. He was doing that because he knew that that which he was providing for them in this somewhat strange way was going to be the very means that would be employed in fulfilling his purposes in relationship to the construction of this tabernacle. And with the delay of Moses in meeting with God, Aaron, we're told, takes matters into his own hands, and he asks the people to take the stuff that they had and essentially to squander it in the creation of a golden calf. And Exodus 32 describes that for us. And at the end of Exodus 32, with the return of Moses, Moses comes back in verse 31 to go to the Lord and say, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. Please forgive their sin. This should not have happened, he said. This should not have happened. And if you go to 34 and to verse 8, you have the picture there of Moses bowing down to the ground, worshiping God, and saying, O Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes— 
then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. In other words, you are the God who has made a covenant with your people. Keep your covenant. Even though we have made a horrible mess of things, even though we have taken what you have provided for us and squandered it in the construction of false gods, please do not leave us alone. Please do not abandon the work of your hands. And here we see the indications of what we finally find in its fulfillment in the New Testament, uh, where in Christ all the promises of God, as we have sung, find their yes and their amen, and all of the promises of him keeping his people, completing the good work that he has begun in them, are found in, in the essence of Jesus himself. And it is a good and a helpful reminder, too, as isn't it, that given that we are prone to wander and prone to leave the God we love, that God uh, is never the author of unfinished business when it comes to his children. And so it is in light of that that we get back to 35, 25, that is Exodus 25. He has given the initial directive. That has uh, been prolonged by the rebellion and by the false worshiping of false gods. And now here Moses once again assembles the Israelite community, reminds them of the importance of the place of the Sabbath, and then, in verse 4, as we have read, gives them the directions for this construction. Now, let's just notice them uh, very straightforwardly. Verse 5, notice the phrase, from what you have, from what you have, take an offering. From what you have. What did they have? What do we have? Only what God, the Creator, has provided. Only what God, the Redeemer, has granted them in their exodus from the bondage of Egypt. Only what God, who has sustained their lives, makes possible for them now in light of the project that is before them. If you like, we might say that everything we have is stamped with the seal of God's ownership. Everything in the universe, it's, there's not a place, as Kuiper, the, uh, the prime minister of the Netherlands many years ago, he says, there's not one inch in the whole universe at which God does not look and say, this is mine. This is all mine. Now, this is vastly different from our contemporary culture, isn't it? Where pantheism suggests that uh, uh, the earth is God and everything is God, and since we are part of everything, there's some, somehow or another we are part of God. Not so, says the Bible. The earth is the Lord's, Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, the earth belongs to God, and everything that grows and is dug up out of the earth, everything that exists in the, enti in the entirety, belongs to God. And some time ago, and I don't say that, I, I say this at some risk, but there's no malice in it. Some time ago, the administrative people here at Parkside decided that we should put a sticker on everything announcing the fact that it was the property of Parkside Church. It seemed to me such a crazy exercise, but it went ahead without any reference to me. They don't really care. But the fact is, I just got such a, such a charge out of, of, of going and, and picking up uh, like the garbage cans out there, you know, and turning them on their side or upside down and looking at the little sticker said, this belongs to Parkside Church, you know? I said, well, what did you expect? If someone was going to steal a garbage can and then they turned it up and said, oh, I didn't realize it belonged to Parkside Church. I guess I better put it back down. Or they even had one on the grand piano, you know? If someone said, oh, the grand piano belongs to Parkside. I should have known better. I was just going to, I was just going to take it home to my living room. I really, I really shouldn't have done that. No, I thought it was a futile exercise. I, I, but anyway, no, nobody really cares. But by the time David is involved in the prospect of building the, 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 uh, the temple, uh, he makes the point very clearly, as he says in 1 Chronicles 29, everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. So we understand this fundamental notion. The directive is, from what you have. What do you have? Only what God has given you. By the time you get to 1 Corinthians 4, he says, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you glory as if you did not receive it? I mean, why would you walk around like you're a self-made man or, or a self-made woman or whatever else it is? No, on every inch of the universe, 
God's ownership is established. Therefore, everything that these people to whom he gives this directive had was a result of God's grace. Second phrase to help us understand the directive is the phrase, everyone who is willing. That's also in verse 5. Everyone who is willing. In other words, this is not a matter of legislation. This is, this is a matter of personal conscience. This is not a matter of Moses as the leader laying an obligation or a guilt trip on the people under his care. No, he says, God asked me to say to you that from what you have, and you know that everything you have is God's, from what you have, bring an offering to the Lord, everyone who is willing. Some people see giving uh, as a grudge. Well, I guess I have to. I suppose I should. Or as a duty. I ought to do this. Or perhaps in response to some measure of guilt, I've been a bad person. I think I should try and be a good person now. Or I think I better give something or something bad might happen to me. All of these things are absolutely against the principle which is here in Exodus 35 and runs throughout the Bible. The giving of the people of God in response to the grace of God is thanksgiving. It is overflowing gratitude, overflowing thankfulness revealed in overflowing generosity. How will God know that we are overflowing in thankfulness by our overflowing generosity? The principle is obvious. Now, given the notion of willingness, we must always beware of anybody who is heavy-handed or who is overly directive in the matter of giving. And you know, we say very little about giving here at Parkside Church. I've chosen to do so today for a number of reasons, but I think I didn't do this for at least two years. And before that, I think it was 12 years. So just in case you're visiting today and would want to extrapolate from this, really you'd have to wait some considerable time before there would be any mention again of these things. No, Aaron was the one who was heavy-handed. Aaron is the one who told them what to do with their earrings. Moses doesn't give any expression regarding earrings. He just says uh, anybody who's willing and whose heart has been stirred up should bring an offering to the Lord. He doesn't tell them what to do or how to do it. And you will notice that, and this is the third phrase, that this is to be brought to the Lord. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Moses is telling the people that the Lord is willing to receive from all who are willing to give. But the Lord, who is in need of nothing, is willing to receive from those who are the beneficiaries of everything when we, the beneficiaries of his grace, as an expression of our overflowing thankfulness, reveal our hearts in overflowing generosity. And when that happens, God is glorified. When that happens, glory and praise is given to God. What is your response to be and my response to be? Look at the response of the people. When he had given these directives, and he gave them with great clarity, with no manipulation, no funny business, verse 20, then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence. They said, okay, we better go away and think about this. And having withdrawn from the presence of Moses, notice what happened. Everyone who was willing and whose heart moved him or whose heart was stirred up, brought an offering, notice again the phraseology, to the Lord for the work. You see, if people have to be cajoled in relationship to the work, well, you've got to explain to me what this is. Well, you've got to explain why that's happening. You've got to explain the next thing. Then they don't understand. I don't understand then what it means to give to the Lord. I'm giving this to the Lord. Yeah, but who's looking after this? Well, in this instance, the elders of the church. In that instance, the elders of Israel. You'll notice that they, all, they didn't only give from what they had, 
but they also gave on the basis of what they were and the gifts that God had given them. And we don't have time to go through this, but I read it as purposefully and as clearly as I could, and it's not an easy passage to read. But weren't you struck by the way in which God fills people with his Spirit for artistic endeavors? That he fills these two characters, particularly and expressly in this way, in order that by the arts, which is essentially what it is, by the arts, by the creativity, by the use of fabrics, by all of these things, by the fragrance of incense and the gems on the ephod and the breastplate of the, of the uh, ministering priest, by all of these things, the work of the Lord was set forward. Another time we'll come back, perhaps, and look at Exodus 35 in terms of a Christian view of the arts. But it's all here in the Bible, and it's really pretty clear. And so the people understood this. And I won't belabor the point, but if you go through later on and just underline to the Lord or the work of the Lord, you will find that this is the recurring emphasis. And in response to the directive, now we discover that eventually they had to call a halt to it. I think there's a measure of humor in verse 4 of 36. I, I hope you do too. So all the skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work on the sanctuary downed tools and went to see Moses and said, Listen, enough already. The people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. You see, they were overflowing in generosity. What happened? They were reminded of the immensity of God's goodness. From what you have, what do I have? Everything you gave me. Who am I giving this to? To the Lord. Why should I do it? Because he stirred my heart. Are we being manipulated? No. Just those who are willing. Just those who are willing. And the crowd that was willing was obviously a significant crowd, and the way in which they brought their stuff was obviously more than overwhelming. And as a result, Moses has to issue a second directive. And he sent the word throughout the camp. Verse 6. Don't you love this? No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. In other words, What's today? The 6th. Then you go to the 13th. You go to the 20th. So on the 20th, let's say, two weeks today, I stand up and I say, hey, listen, no, no more of that budget stuff. We're completely done with the, with the budget. Please, please, do not, please do not give any more at all. Overflowing thankfulness revealed in overflowing generosity. God does not administer his grace in percentages. He lavishes his grace upon his people. And out of the abundance of his heart in Jesus, he has given to his people one blessing after another. Let's then say a word concerning our reaction to this, or the application of their reaction. God has come to Moses, and he said, I have a plan for my tabernacle. I want you to convey this to the people so that those who are willing may respond accordingly. We read our Bibles, and essentially the story is the same. God has a plan for saving people through the work of his Son. And he says, I want those who have their hearts stirred up and who are willing to help by giving to gospel work. To help by giving to gospel work. When I have occasion to write a thank you note for those who've given to the work of Truth For Life, I try always to write with the same phraseology. I'm sure I mistake sometimes. But I'm careful to say, I want to thank you today for the gift that you've given to the work of the gospel via Truth For Life. You've given a gift to the work of the gospel via Truth For Life. But your gift is a gospel gift. And the people here realized that they were involved in something that was far bigger than anything they knew about God meeting with his people, about God reaching out beyond his people to the alien peoples, and so on. And in the same way, you and I become part of a great missionary project when we do as we've pledged to do. We're involved in the work of the gospel. And what the Bible says is, given that this is our privilege and our opportunity, would we not give ourselves in response to overflowing grace with overflowing generosity. There's a wonderful epitaph on the wall of a military officer in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. 
which reads as follows, sacred to the memory of Charles George Gordon, who at all times and everywhere gave his strength to the weak, his substance to the poor, his sympathy to the suffering, and his heart to God. Actually, it should start with he gave his heart to God, and then from there. I need to draw this to a close. Some of you are staring at me. <laughs> but this notion of overflowing generosity needs to be seen in light of a few things, and I can't work these out, but let me just give them to you. Number one, an unreserved commitment to Christ. An unreserved commitment to Christ. I am not committed to Christ if my wallet is not involved. The rich young ruler went away sad, having asked all the right questions, was concerned about eternal life, but he was not prepared for unreserved commitment to Christ. Any giving that doesn't begin with our unreserved commitment to Christ is not biblical giving. Secondly, such overflowing generosity must be exercised in keeping with what we have, in keeping with what we have. When Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16, he says that your giving should be according to your means. According to your means. In other words, he says, I don't want you to get involved in an emotional surge. I don't want you to take your brain out in relationship to this. I want you to think about what's going on. And our means at one time may be better than at another time. The earning capacity of an individual in his middle years will be different from that retired person in most circumstances, and so we would be able to discriminate. But once again, it is the stirring of the heart, the willingness of the Spirit, unreservedly committed to Jesus, and in keeping with what we have. And also, such overflowing generosity has to be exercised in light of our obligation— to our God-given economic duties. In relationship to our God-given economic duties, which are what? Well, what is it, 8.5% sales tax? Whatever the basic rate of income tax, and then there's some on top? Or whether you like tax, don't like tax, like the idea of it, and whatever else it is, doesn't matter. Romans 13 says we have an actual God-given obligation to play our part in these things. Therefore, what we do in relationship to a willing, stirred heart in terms of overflowing generosity has to be seen in light of that, our obligation to the state and our obligation to our families. Someday at another time, I will speak to this issue, but I think there are two things by observation that are totally crazy. You don't need to care about this, and you don't need to pay attention to what I'm telling you, but this is my observation. I personally think it's wrong to pass on to our children unbelievable debt as a result of their education. I don't believe that is clever parenting. People disagree with me. That's just my view. They start off so far behind that it's almost impossible for them to catch up, and it encourages all kinds of bad activity vis-a-vis -vis their responsibility and vis-a-vis -vis credit and everything else. And at the other end of the scale, I don't think that we should be so quick to buy the contemporary Western notion that what you're supposed to do is labor all your life to make sure that you're not a burden to your children. But I'm trying to make this simple point, that there are, that there are divine obligations to state and to family that play into this. And also, and finally, that such overflowing generosity needs to be exercised in light of what I might refer to as the law of equivalent returns. The law of equivalent returns. Where do you get that from? The economist or something? Somebody says, no, I got it from Proverbs 11. One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. That's what I'm referring to as the law of equivalent returns. Proverbs 11:24. one man gives freely, and he figures he's got even more to give. Another man says, oh, no, I can't, I can't give to that. If you saw where I am right now, there's no way that I uh, No, no. One man withholds unduly. The key is in that. Is that an adverb? I don't know. But comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. P. 
People curse the man who hoards grain, but blessing crowns him who is willing to sell. In other words, well, no, that's going to sound like Reaganomics. I'll just leave that one alone. But the fact of the matter is, I think it may well actually be right there. Let me finish with a lady, as I did last Sunday morning. You know this lady well. She showed up at the house of Simon the leper. Jesus was there. It was a routine kind of evening. That was right up until the point that she came in and started smashing, smashing a jar of perfume. She had an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, the equivalent of a year's wages, apparently, not just some little trinket that she picked up at Dillard's, but something that would have been used either for a dowry on the occasion of her wedding or would be used for the embalming of a loved one in the, at the occasion of their death. And this lady came to Jesus, and she took this, and she created a stink with it, a beautiful fragrance that would have hung on people for a long time. And people would have said, Man, boy, do you smell good. What is that? Where were you? He said, well, we were at the house of Simon the leper, and the lady showed up, and she s smashed this alabaster jar of perfume. It must have been some perfume that you are so— Yeah, it was costly in its bestowal. It was thoughtful in its uniqueness. It was timely in its provision. And it was challenging in its impact. That's why the people immediately began to say, that's ridiculous. I can't believe she did that. This could have been sold for a year's wages, and all could have been given to the poor. Jesus said, don't play the poor card right now. That's not the card to play right now. That's, you know that's not the issue, he says. What this lady has done will be reported throughout the world forever. Why? because it was an expression of overflowing generosity that stemmed from overflowing thankfulness, which was the response to overflowing grace. Every tight-fisted believer will inevitably—we will inevitably have our fists open when we stand before the cross of Christ and we say with Andre Crouch, how can I say thanks for the things you've done for me? And who are these people? Those who are willing, whose hearts have been stirred, who bring an offering to the Lord for the work. What work? The work of seeing unbelieving people become committed followers of Jesus Christ. And then the people withdrew to think this out. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.